Good evening, a very warm welcome to Dan Really Likes Wine, presented by Pick and Pay. And first up, some reassurance. I had a number of people get hold of me, led by Ina Smith from Shannon Blanc, South Africa, saying, Dan, what happened to Artie Bardenhorst? Now, you might remember Artie was supposed to be on the show along with Ibn Sadi Thursday last week. And no matter what we did, we sent faxes, we sent telegrams, we had a couple of pigeons released from the Malmesbury Post Office. We could not find Mr. Bardenhorst. We sent me an email the next day. Very simple. He'd been out pruning, got stuck into his work, and completely forgot about everything else he was supposed to be doing, including joining me online. So we're very sorry to miss you, Adi. But the upside was a fascinating hour or thereabouts with Ibn Sadi, and that is still available on Dan Really Likes Wine, on both the Facebook page and the YouTube channels. If you'd like to go and watch that conversation with such a groundbreaking winemaker from the Swatland, then it is there for you to go and enjoy. Also, for you to enjoy, oh, we're going back about two, three months now, we had Melu Lambert on the show, the Louis Rurera Young Wine Writer of the Year for 2019, picked up that award in London, and it was a much justified award. There is a sparkle and a playfulness to her writing that comes off a platform of extraordinary knowledge and a voracious thirst both for wine but also for the history of wine the knowledge of wine the understanding of wine and she's got a new website melulambert.com it's got a lot of her writing her wine reviews just a really nice celebration of her work of south african mostly wine and it's well worth a visit melulambert.com head over when you get a moment, it is well, well worth a visit. It's also well worth being with me today, not for your chiseled, good-looking athletic host, but rather for two fabulous guests. One of them is the assistant, so somebody we had on the show about a week and a half ago, David Sardi from David and Nadia Wines. His assistant winemaker is a guy called Andre Brains, and Andre has the City on a Hill label. I'm going to be casting a couple of the 2018s from Andre's level. It started as a little side project. It's going into something a little more substantial than that, and we will get Andre's story. But we kick off with someone who, although seemingly living in a rather remote corner of the Cape, when you have a look at the website, is actually just 50 minutes or so driving reasonably from Cape Town, and so well worth visiting. Something many Cape Townians know, because the accommodation on his estate is sold out this week, and I think next week as well. It is a wonderful retreat. It's got all sorts of attractions to it, including a small but rather successful wine operation that is fiercely organic and very, very carefully nurtured and tended, and all done by an enormously passionate winemaker who is with us today to kick off the show. A very good evening, Johan Simons from the Dragon Ridge wine brand. Warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. And, and good evening. I'm, I'm very excited uh, to have you on board. I've got a couple of my very first bottles of Dragon Ridge to open, and I'm looking forward to sharing them with you this evening. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be with you. Shall I start with the first one? Talk about well, I, th I think before we jump into them, maybe just a little bit of background, because uh, although I've never been out to your estate, I do know it well from reading about it, from talking to people about it. And there are a couple of things that stand out uh, in terms of both your wine philosophy and the estate you make your wine on, the Fainboss estate. And I think leading the, uh, the character of what you do is this very strong, very firm commitment to organic farming and not just a, a throwaway, let's put a nice green label on our wine, but everything you do is based around a great deal of care for the environment and the wine that you produce. Yeah, it is so. Uh, in fact, the wines are organically certified from 2019 onwards. We, we never bothered before that. I'm still not sure if it's commercially worthwhile, but We've always made the wine like that, and the vineyards have been organically run since we came in 1997. Uh, unirrigated bush vines, by and large, granite sands, um, fairly low yields. Some of the vineyards are very old. Uh, the the Shedden blocks are at least 30 years old, and some one block's more like uh, 63 it was planted, so whatever that is, uh, 50 something. And the, we don't have any blocks less than 20 years old. That's the kind of youngest wine grapes we have. Uh, the Pinotage is about 23, 22, 23, and 
that's what goes into this particular wine. The Supernova is a Chenin Pinotage blend, a whole bunch press. Yields aren't very large and um, co-fermented and then uh, bottled. It's a method ancestral, so there's no um, base wine. We start fermenting, we keep racking when the sugar gets to be, we guess, 24 we bottle. And then um, about nine months later, sometimes a bit longer, we riddle and disgorge. Fill up with the same bottle so that there's no sulfur, I think. The Supernova 2017 says low sulfites. I think it's um, three parts per million free total, rather, and one part per million free. So it isn't essentially no sulfur. Um, uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned method ancestral there, Johan, for yeah. people who don't know too much about uh, the, the mechanics, the physics of wine. They think, okay, well, if it's bubbles, A, it must be Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, or Meunier, and that, that's probably what it's made of, and it must be Cup Classique or something similar. Uh, you, you touched on the style, but it's a it's almost a truncated version of Cup Classique, and as you're illustrating here uh, with Shannon and Pinot uh, playing around with some varietals we, we wouldn't normally expect to find in a bottle of South African bubbles. Well, okay, so if you... I mean, Shannon is a very um, mutable wine. Great, you can pretty much do anything with it. And Pinotage, of course, is half its parents of Pinot Noir. So it's not that far away from the Chardonnay Pinot Noir blend. You do, in fact, make 100% Chardonnay bubbly as well in the same way. The method ancestral thing came when we started making bubbly. Uh, Swiping independent producers have a rule which said you weren't allowed to use commercial yeasts. That rule has been changed since then for, for bubblies, but at the time we didn't have the choice. So we thought we could make it the way bubbly had been made originally in France before it was sort of, we had a French winemaker the first year we made it. His comment was, we stopped making it like this 200 years ago in France. I cannot understand why you are persisting. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that you have. Uh, in terms of the characteristics of this style, one thing I've always found with it is it's it's generally slightly sweeter than some of the drier Cup Classiques. What, what would the reason for that be? I, so, in this case, not so. The, the sugar is less than three grams. These are bone dry wines. The reason is is because you can't predict if you're using a natural ferment which most of the ancestrals are you have to guess two things you've got to guess how efficient is your yeast and exactly when do you bottle so you want to go for around about 24 grams of sugar per liter when you when you start bottling the wine but in our case it takes seven or eight hours to bottle the wine it's very slow it's fermenting quite fiercely it takes a while to fill each bottle appropriately. And you can't, so you might say, okay, I'm going to start at 28 grams or 29 grams, and then the last bottles will be at 22 or 21 or whatever, because it's fermenting all the time, and see where you, what you come out at. If you get it wrong, you're going to get two things that are going to happen. You're going to have a sweeter wine, which you don't necessarily want, and also most of the bottles are going to explode. <laughs> because... That's what happens if you get the sugar wrong. I've, uh, I've read a number of stories about the dangers of making Method Ancestral hundreds of years ago in France. Lots of bleeding French winemakers paying the price for getting that wrong. Sounds like you've certainly got it right, though, especially if it is bone dry. So uh, let's have a crack at the uh, uh, the first of them. This is our 27. <laughs> Um, and t tell me about Dragon Ridge. I'm led to believe that if the sun is just right and you've had 11 glasses of wine and you're looking at a particular angle, you might almost confuse one of the mountains with a dragon sometimes. Yeah, it's kind of a sleeping dragon. And the other side is, like, is Sonpo, where the sun first hits the farm. So the Dragon Ridge is on the... Uh, it's on the western, no, it's west facing, so it's the eastern slope of the farm. And that's where the Pinotage and the Shedden are both on that side. Um, Pinotage really likes heat. 
for some reason. I mean, in our case, it gets no choice. Swartan gets very hot in summer. It's the second grape we pick often. Um, maybe a bit of shin early and then the pinotage. Often the sort of third week of January. Sometimes around 16 to 17 for the bubbly. So we're trying to pick something around about 18, 19 sugar. And uh, we're not going to get much. We usually get about 250 liters a ton in the, in the co press. And uh, it gets racked and then it's allowed to ferment. So we then rack it every day for about, I suppose, 10 days. And then we test the sugar. So as soon as the sugar gets to be 24, we bottle it under crown cap. And then nine months later, we disgorge, remarge and disgorge and put under cork with a cap. So it's right. properly cleaned up. It doesn't have any, it's not cloudy. Well, let's uh, let's have a look at the results. Uh, I can also say thank you, Johan, because you're inadvertently helping me. I've been studying furiously for my WSET exam that comes up this weekend. And uh, that was one of the chapters I was reading while my kids were distracting me over the weekend. So thank you for the uh, addition to the knowledge. Thank you for the wine, which I'm opening now. Oh, there we go. The little puff of smoke like a vanishing genie. And, uh, and into the glass. Oh, nice, rich, golden colour there. Looking luxurious. Hmm. It's got a real amber feel to it. Quite, quite a lot of bubbles. Hmm. Ah. Hmm. Hmm. So that. Johan, is my very first sip ever of Dragon Ridge wine. I, I shall enjoy it. I shall deem it a success. It is wonderfully dry. Um, it's got a lovely toastiness to it. Mm. Oh, that's very good. And the, the, the last, the, I haven't had a huge amount of uh, method ancestral. The, uh, um, uh, the pet left, as uh, it's sometimes called. Um, but that, that I have had, I generally find it's a little bit on the sweet side for me. Uh, but this is anything but. You've got this, as you say, beautifully, beautifully dry. Yeah, I mean, I understand if you make it in large quantities, we don't. So the maximum we can bottle is around about a thousand bottles like this. If we make a, an MCC, we can probably do double that, a small operation. And then a thousand bottles, we usually get it back around about 600 if we're lucky. We lose quite a lot. And that's only because we use the same wine to fill up the bottles. We don't, there's no dosage. And the, the wine itself is quite dirty, you can imagine, because it's not really, it's not a base wine, it's actually an actively fermenting wine. So even though we rack it, it's still fairly dirty when it goes into the bottle. It does it does sound, yeah, like an awful lot of work to make this. What, what is the drive mm. to go for this particular style, and and do you feel that the the effort is well rewarded? Uh, well, as I said, we had no choice in the beginning, and then subsequently we have made two uh, MCCs. So we've made a, exactly exactly the same. The twenty eighteen, we split the the wine into half. And half we bottled and half we put back into barrel and then we turned into a, we kept it for a year in barrel and then turned it into an MCC supernova uh, 2018, which is now being released. So you can directly compare the two styles. Financially, it's better to make Cup Classique. It's a much, it's a much less wasteful pro process. <laughs> Mm. But these things don't give you a headache. They're easy to drink. They, there's no sulfur in them, of course. Um, I don't think there is much anyway in, in, in bubblies, but there's none in this. And um, they're nice, you know. <laughs> Always a drinking experience. What do you feel like? Is it a, a wine that you can sort of drink all afternoon? And I feel yes. So I consider that a plus. <laughs> 
Right. Well, let's um, let's see how it racks up against the 2018, which is the second of the two. Um, as I open mine and do so while attempting not to get a cork up my nose, uh, was there any marked difference in either the the makeup or the climate or the conditions around this wine compared to the previous year? No, we pretty much do it right. So uh, both the wines are low in alcohol, 10.5 uh, percent both years. It's interesting that the, the Cup Classique versions of these wines have always 1% more alcohol, so 11.5. So, well, that's partly because we have then um, used the same base wine and we picked it at the same time, but of course with Cup Classique you then add some sugar to get some additional alcohol and bubbles in the bottle at the end, so you get a slightly more alcoholic wine. Um, in profile, I don't know. I think I I have no preference. They both very fizzy. As as I'm discovering upon opening that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's my uh, it's my Brad Binder moment after yesterday. Spraying champagne all over the town really likes wine cellar. They are very fizzy. These bubbles are great. All right, so unsurprisingly, given it's younger, I'm seeing a, a slightly paler color. Is it, uh, is it exactly the same blend as the, as the year before? Yeah, 50, 50, yeah. Pinotage, Shannon. Mm. All right, so I'm seeing the color is different. Uh, what, uh, what from the trained palette of your Hans Simons is no, the difference between these two? Yeah, I pick up a little less red fruit. The, the, the 17 seems to me got a bit more red fruit in it. In a way, this tastes more kind of classic. The, the 2018 tastes more like a sort of what you think get from a French probably in a way. Not quite sure why that is. Well, quite probably, lemony. Hmm. Probably a tribute to the fact that some of those French champagne houses are now making champagne that is so good it could almost be called entry level Cap Classique or South African Method Ancestral. Yeah, you don't you don't want to say that too loudly. The the, the French winemaker who helped us, he actually owns a champagne house. <laughs> and uh, his biggest worry when he came here was in fact South African bubblies. Uh, he, he thought that was 2014, so he thought South African bubblies were, we could kill the French if they were properly marketed, just in terms of quality. Well, if you take that quality and you, you then add the price, uh, you've got a, a serious competitor for champagne. Well, what, what sort of price would these go at, John? 250 a bottle now, I think. All right. Uh, well, it's, it's probably not so much the price, but the finding them and getting hold of them that is the challenge, given you you only make a 1,000 bottles. So probably your best yeah, bet, jump in the car, drive out to the estates, come and stay for the weekend and go home with a case or two. Yeah, well, people can do that. We're always happy. They, uh, all of these bubblies, some of them at least are going to the States. Uh, so that'll be hopeful to turn into something if we have any customers left after the pandemic. Which, um, uh, which leads to a question I was going to ask, and it's one I've, I've asked most of the people we've had on the show for the last three, four months now, and the impact that the the alcohol ban has, has had. Uh, it's obviously hit everybody and hit them in different ways. Well, what's been the biggest impact for you? Well, I think some of our bigger customers were restaurants, and that's not gone well. The bigger, the bigger restaurants, especially, um, I think, have suffered a lot, and I don't know whether some of them will survive. Yeah, um, I think we had uh, we had a conversation with Ken Forrester last week, and he'd received just that day notes from two restaurants he supplied who had added to the list of those who had to close their doors for the very last time. And it's been been desperately, desperately sad. If there is a, a little silver lining to this particular time, though, I've seen a real sense of 
the winemaking community coming together, supporting each other, trying to, to unite as one. Uh, although that's never really been a, that much of a challenge in the Swatland, I, I would suggest, because uh, from everyone I've spoken to in the last few weeks and everyone I know from the Swatland wine space, you do seem to be a, a very strong winemaking community. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, since the inception of the independent producers in 2011, there's quite a good community spirit. You know, we have regular tastings. We meet quite often. We have strange competitions. This year, a band, you know, what, what's it called? Beat My Boss. That, that didn't happen. It's a sausage making competition for wine makers. <laughs> I'm glad, um, glad you clarified that for us, Johan. <laughs> yeah. Well, but there are things in like a street party in, in November or whatever, whatever. Uh, we're going to do then we don't know because no one really knows what the situation is going to be like going forward i don't think that they're going to change the lockdown alcohol lockdown for at least a month i suspect i suspect we'll go to september before anything happens uh, and i just don't know you know like around we're going to, we're going to be able to make it I, uh, for obvious reasons, hope that you're terribly wrong on that, Johan, but it does sound like it could well be possible. Uh, before we let you go, uh, I know you've got loads of people coming out this weekend, uh, next weekend coming to stay, uh, take advantage of the accommodation. Uh, plenty to do with the Feinboss Estate, uh, headlined by drinking some terrific wine. We've had two lovely examples of South African uh, method ancestral. What other wine have you got? What else can people look out for if they do come and pay a visit? So we've got a couple of red blends, a San Giovese cap and a um, Pinotage Mouvedre cap. That's two. And then we've got uh, a usual, uh, you know, a, a Shannon, a Shannon Vionier blend, Vionier by itself, uh, a few other reds, dessert Shannon, a straw wine, that is. And, uh, they're quite a lot. Uh, an orange Shannon as well. Um, <laughs> oddities <laughs> which of course are not at all comparable to the man who makes them all who is Johan Simons who's got a, a terrific selection Johan uh, thank you so much I'm looking forward to getting down to come and make uh, my debut at Feinboss and uh, see the home of the Dragon Ridge wines but until then uh, I've got some fantastic uh, fantastic cup uh, method ancestral to drink here. Uh, Ten point five percent alcohol, I think, is an added bonus. A lot of people looking for something slightly lighter. Well, this does the trick delightfully and very, very dry indeed. Uh, Johan, thank you. Uh, I hope that your Nostradamus-like qualities are as bad as your winemaking is good. See <laughs> wine open later on this week. Uh, but for now, keep making terrific wine. Uh, I know uh, not. I, I don't think it travels more than five hundred meters from grape to bottle in terms of the whole process that's it's true. A, yeah, uh, that is what happened you know, very, it's very, very authentic winemaking operation and uh, all the better for it Johan, thank you so much really really appreciate the time thank you dan Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Lovely to have you with us. We, uh, we actually mentioned you and we had David on the show uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he speaks very highly of you, uh, which is unsurprising because your wine speaks very highly of you and has uh, for a little time now. Uh, talk us through the journey here because you are a uh, an assistant winemaker and a brand that in itself is growing and becoming more and more recognized around the world. And 
getting a lot of very high profile advocates behind it. Uh, how did this little project come along and how did it spiral into something quite so impressive quite so quickly? Yeah, Dan, um, I've always, you know, I finished my studies in, in, in uh, 2000 and what's it now, 2005. And I think for, for the majority of the time after that, I wanted to, I wanted to make my own wine. And um, yeah, I just uh, uh, like when I always when I drew up the, the the budget, I would just leave it right there, you know. So it, it's it's it cost a lot of it cost quite a bit of money to get started on. So that's why a lot of us start small, you know. So um, but yeah, so you know, I worked with a couple of other uh, a couple of other wineries, but then in 2015, I started with the with the first vintage uh, of City on Hill. Um, and uh, I was still doing some other work. I, I took a break um, out of the wine industry for, for about three years. I did some, you know, I worked with, with students and, 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 and youth, did some, some, some ministry with them. And um, so then I got back uh, full time in, 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 20, in 2015. And uh, I bumped into David at, uh, at Strays Bar. Uh, and uh, we had a bride one evening, and I said to him, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a space to. Uh, you know, to make my wines, and David said, "Well, I'm looking for some extra pair of hands during harvest." And that was that was January 2016. I clocked in there, and you know, the deal was kind of, you know, just come help me for the harvest, and I'm still there after, you know, after almost you know, four or five years. Um, but yeah, sit on the hill. Um, you know, it's it's been a it's been a massive learning curve. Um, you know, they, you know. I studied winemaking, but I didn't study business, you know, so you learn those kind of things you know, as you go along. So that's been quite sobering, especially in, 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 you know, in times like these. Um, but yeah, I, I think in terms of just pure enjoyment of, you know, having, you know, being able to make your own wine, it's been one of the most, I think, one of the most satisfying things that I've done. The project has a remarkably similar story of origin to that of David's own wine because he was doing something fairly similar, making wine for somebody else and then starting his side project. So he'll, he'll know exactly where you're coming from. Yeah, well, David and I, we, we, we know one another from those days. You know, I, I was working uh, for, for, uh, for another winery and he was kind of the, the well, it's, it's far neighbors, but, you know, they're, they're your neighbors, you know, so... So we actually know one another from those days. Um, so when we met up again, it wasn't too strange just meeting up. You know, we, you know, we both knew, you know, we wanted to, you know, we wanted to start our own, our own um, company, our own brand. And, uh, and yeah, it's just um, in terms of, well, David and Nadia has, has grown and, and, you know, they deserve all the accolades they're receiving. You know, there's a lot of hard work goes into, you know, to, to the David and Nadia brand. Um, but yeah, but City on the Hill, you know, I've been, I've been very fortunate, you know, that they've been, um, you know, supporting me doing, doing what I want to do. And, um, and yeah, so, you know, so we, the, the, the idea is, uh, you know, we, <laughs> we haven't really talked about it, you know, but that's been growing every year. I've been, you know, I started out in 2015 with about 900 odd bottles and, uh, end of 2019, I bottled more or less 11,000 bottles. So it's, it's been growing quite nicely um, within about four or five years. So, it's, yeah, so I'm, I'm quite happy with that. And that begs the question, uh, it's not like you can set aside your winemaking and do it in August when you're nice and quiet. Uh, wine tends to get made at roughly the same time. How do you yeah. balance the two jobs of assistant winemaker at David and Nadia while still making your own? Yeah, that's that's the that's the difficult uh, part of this then um is is balancing both um you know you can't you can't do 50 percent of the one and 50 percent of the other you have to go full out for both or leave it you know it, there's no um you know you, you talk to a lot of other guys in the smart plant you know there's a lot of younger guys in, in other areas that's also doing their own thing i think the you know the the quality that's out there is um you know, is amazing. And if I'm gonna if I'm gonna drop the ball, the city on the hill, then you know I might as well I might as well just uh, let it go altogether. You know, so um, you know as as the fair enough as the you know as the volumes grow, it gets it gets a little bit tougher to you know to balance everything. Um, but you know, luckily, you know we're quite fluid in that way that you know, you know I'm, 
if, if there's something that needs to be done urgently, um, you know, then I then I do it. Whether it's for City on Hill or whether it's for David and Nadia, you know, the one that's that you know, the one that that, that that's the most urgent, you know, gets gets attention first, you know. But but we try to plan for those kind of things, and and, and during August, you know, it's um, we share a couple of vineyards, um, but you know, the guy, if if if, if David's grapes come in first, then we process it first, and if my grapes come in first, we process those first. So. It's not a it's it's not a um uh, it's not a case of, of of first that and then this one it's like you know we we try to prioritize the important things and um we try just to you know to schedule it nicely and, and, and to plan long enough before that you're clearly getting it right i'm not sure how long it can continue the city on a hill continues to get bigger and bigger as one of our comments attests to lisa harlow writing in and saying that uh, City on a Hill was my, uh, City on a Hill White was my favourite white from my last trip, thanks to the wine shop in Ribic Castile. Mm -hmm. uh, so you do have plenty of fans out there. Fans mm -hmm. of a name uh, that I suspect, Andre, has got some religious connotations. I know faith is a very big part of your life, and you referenced the ministry a little earlier. Um, uh, I'm guessing that's where the name comes from? Yes, Dan, that's exactly where it comes from. Um, so, yeah, Matthew 5.14 uh, talks about City on Hill, and, um, you know, it goes on to say that you are the, you know, the salt of the earth, and, and, and you know, that's, uh, you know, making wine is, is an expression of, of my faith. You know, it's the way you do things. It's the way you, um, the way you interact with people. It's the way um, you try to put other people first, you know, and, and you also make mistakes, you know, we're not, we're not perfect. Um, we, we, we do get it wrong sometimes, but, you know, the, the idea is um, that this is not about us. You know, this is not only about us. Yes, we need to make good wine, and, and I'm very, very passionate about wine. It's one of my favorite things, but there's more to City on Hill than only wine. And, and we've, got, we've got big ideas and big dreams for, for the future, which, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot bigger than, than, than I think that I'm, that I'm capable of. But, but you know, I know there's, there's grace for us for this, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to what's coming. But for the moment, you know, we, we need to be present in the moment, enjoy the people. And that's one of the, that's one of the great things of the SWAT plant is, you know, you've, you've mentioned it, the community. Um, and that's one of the things that, 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 um, that drew me to the SWAT plant. You know, I haven't been here. I'm one of the new guys in the SWAT plant. But the way that the other guys have welcomed me, um, uh, into you know into their midst was you know it was one of the most humbling things that I've ever experienced and I you know every time we get together I can't wait you know it's really the personalities and the jokes and everything is yeah I, it's it's one of the best for me this is the the the, the biggest advantage of the SWAT plant is the way that the guys keep together and 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 try to promote the SWAT plant you know it's it's truly an amazing thing. And that is a refrain that has echoed through every Swartland conversation I've had over the last two or three weeks. So nothing new there, but nice to have it reinforced yet again. The camaraderie does link you. What also links you up is the ability to make rather good wine. So let's delve straight into the first of the two that we have. This is your white blend. What are we drinking in this blend, Mr. Brains? Dan, that's... Um, um... Yeah, the white blend is uh, it's it, it's always going to be shen and heavy. Yeah, um, if I can say it that way. So it's uh, eighty six percent shen and with twelve percent viognier and two percent muscat Alexandri or Anapurt as we call it. Uh, you know, as it's more well known locally. Um, but you know, the idea of the idea of this wine is and 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 just it's the same with the red is um, you know it's got the more colourful expression uh, on the label. Um, you know, and it's supposed to be the more the more a canvas wine uh you know in, in my portfolio uh, if i can say it like that you know so it, it's kind of it needs to paint a picture of you know what is in the swat plant um what are we farming with what you know and and you know we are it needs to tell the true story of the varieties planted in the swat plant and i mean yet given and a couple of and david and a couple of other guys on you they you know they all make these extravagant white blends uh, with all these varieties and you know if you're going to come back to the swart plant in 10 years we're going to work with varieties that i can't pronounce you know so you know we, we there's a lot of planning ahead in terms of new varieties and um and and you know we need to we need to see what works in the swart plant you know it, it, we've had good rain this far this year but we, we had a massive drought in the, in the last couple of years so we need to look to varieties that you know that can stand the heat and can stand the you know these kind of extreme conditions 
so this is a story about that the white blend and the red blend you know um so it's going to be a wine that's going to evolve every year in terms of varieties um you know it's, it's massive fun to, to stumble upon a new vineyard or a new variety um now i i, I was looking for columbine um to, to to work with uh, in the 2020 event it's now to find a lot of people and i had to go look for uh you know for for a lot of yeah you know, i a lot of farmers and phone around and, and so on and then we eventually we got we got some um but you know that's part of the that's part of the fun of it you know is to, to go and look for vineyards and to you know to see how we can better express the swart plant and i think white blends and red, red blends are you know are, are the perfect way to do that no, just don't tell Craig Hawkins that he uh, won't talk to you ever again. Uh, you uh, uh, you mentioned the the blend. I see Ina Smith uh, jumping in, very excited about your Shannon Blanc from the Shannon Blanc Association. Uh, this, of course, as you say, eighty six percent Shannon. What's amazing to me though is that there's only two percent Muscat in this, and yet you still know it's there. It uh, it it really might. It's a bit like my wife. She's Greek, very small, but you always know she's there. <laughs> yeah, then you have to be careful with uh, varieties like Muscat. Um, and I, with all the floral varieties, um, Viennia the same. Um, I tried to pick a little bit earlier um, to get you get the bonus of the acidity, but um, it doesn't become overly floral. Um, now, if you put two you can pick you can pick Muscat very ripe and put in two percent, and it's going to ruin the wine. But you know, you have to be very careful with with the things like Muscat. Um, especially if you want to make wines that's going to age, um, and that's that's the you know that's what I tried to do with, with, with this white wine. I had a 2015 on the weekend, and it's it's still it's it's very very nice. And um, so so you have to think you have to think ahead a little bit. You know you, you can't you can't only make wines to you know to get great scores in the you know in the first year of release. You have to think ahead a little bit. Although I sometimes wonder you know how much wine is kept longer than two or three years but you know we always look you know a little bit longer or into the future a little bit more and and you don't want to make a wine that in two or three years is going to become all about the muscat i still want us to get the benefit of the shannon of the viennia and the, all the other varieties that i'm looking to work with in the future yeah, though, speaking of those of the future and the drier grapes, five years' time, we'll have you on the show to discuss the new city on a hill, Asirtiko, which I suspect is going to become a, a Swatland rock star in years to come. Uh, so this is the white. It's uh, it's lovely as it is, but I'm uh, I'm looking forward to seeing where it gets to. So I think uh, led by that fabulous Shannon of yours, it's got a, a terrific future ahead of it. So that is our white. Then on to the red. Uh, and again, I, I love the labels. It's beautiful artwork. Who's who's responsible for the art on the labels there, Andre? Yeah, so uh, I um, I was also looking for someone for a very specific style of of um, um, you know of of uh, of artwork. If I, if I can, I'm not I'm not an art or art appreciator. I must I must confess this. So my lingo is not correct with this. So someone's gonna give me a hiding afterwards. But um, um, I stumbled or not stumbled across, but I was introduced to someone in Stellenbosch. Her name is Michelisa, um, and um, she she's got a she had an art studio called the Boermeis, if I'm not mistaken. And um, I was immediately, you know, we we clicked in terms of, you know, um, she's also, you know, faith is very important to her as well, and that's the kind of style that she paints with. Is 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 you know, from is from that place. So. I was looking for someone who could who could express city on a hill um, that way, you know. Like I, I explained the you know the philosophy to her, and, and and I said just go for it. And she she painted the white and the red, and um, you know it's it's massive canvas is hanging in my house, um, so we can look at it every day. So but yeah, so Michelisa um, was you know she she did a great job. Um, she's moved. Uh, uh, um, She's moved the studio into a house, so now she paints the walls in a house, which is insane. Even whenever I go there, you know, I've been there a couple of times, it's always amazing to see the way that she that she decorates her house with the painting. Um, but yeah, so uh, so she did it for me yeah, from Stellenbosch. 
She's done a fantastic job, and if her business savvy is anywhere near the quality of her art, she will have turned down payment instead of lots of cases of wine, which would have been the far wiser way uh, to take commission. And uh, we've already got thumbs up for the white, uh, so let's have a try of the red. And where the white is a blend, uh, this is a single varietal, is that right? Yeah, for, for this vintage. So, so as I said, with the, the, the idea is the same with the red. So already with 2019, there's, there's a couple of other varieties with that. But, you know, I've got, a, I've got a thing for Syrah and for Shannon. Those are my two favorite varieties. You know, I spent some time in the, in the North Rhone when I was um, well, a couple of years ago and, and, and I did always did for about two months. And um, I got immediately, I got, you know, sucked in by the culture of, um, you know, how they appreciate wine, the French. I don't know if it's if it's like that in all the region in all the regions, but you know, uh, Pierre Gaia is the guy in the north uh, in the north, right in the town called Malaval, and um, you know we had uh, we had one for breakfast basically. Um, so they they would uh, we would start working at seven thirty, and um, by nine o'clock the winemaker would call us in. We would open two bottles of wine. We would have baguettes. Uh, from Mars and Charcuterie, you know, for an hour, then we go back to work. So it's, it, it's a lot, it's a lot about the culture there. And, and that's something that I will always remember. And I think that's part of why Syrah is so special to me, um, is, you know, because of the experience that I had with, with the guys in the North Rome. Um, but as a, you know, Syrah is my favorite red grape, like uh, Shannon is my favorite white. Um, but yeah, but this, this, this specific wine won't, um, won't remain uh, a single varietal. That was the first release. And uh, I just thought, you know, Going to, it's going to be the best wine. Uh, it's, it's going to be a straight sealer for 2018. That's well, also a great start. This is soft and it just purrs. It's uh, it's really lovely, uh, especially for something that is relatively relatively young. Uh, you talk about broadening this into into something bigger. Where where does City on a Hill go more generally? And uh, is it uh, is it going to be time in the next few years to uh, say a, a sad farewell to Nadia and David? as City on a Hill explodes into its own global phenomenon. Yeah, I think I think long term that, that was always the that was always the plan. Um, but yeah, I, 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 you know, when I started with with, uh, with the white blend, I only made the white blend for I think two or three years and then I added a, a single varietal Shannon. Then I added a single varietal Muscat, um, which is, um, yeah, you know, it's just a funny, it's a funny variety or funny addition to the lineup. And I've, <coughs> excuse me. So I've added some reds. So that was the first red I added to the portfolio. And um, I also added a single variety of Syrah and the Tinta Barocca. So um, in terms of growth of the portfolio, I think I'm, I'm okay for now. Um, but yeah, I'm, you know, for me, it's a good representation of things that I like to work with. And I think things that represent the smart plant, uh, Accurately. And by extension from that, before we let you go, the uh, the Swartland as a whole, the the revolution I think has gone, and it's now well established as being uh, such a a hot and happening center of winemaking, not just in South Africa but right around the world. Uh, I suspect it won't be a dissimilar answer, but I'll ask the question nonetheless: where you see uh, the broader Swartland vision over the next five to ten years. Yes, if I can just say from someone that's, um, you know, I haven't been there from the start, you know, when I started the revolution and stuff like that, something that I've, that I've, that I've seen and that I you know, really appreciate, you know, I'm not, I'm not the most, you know, extravagant uh, personality, you know, I, I like to keep it tidy, I like to keep it clean, and, um, you know, we, but I've seen, you know, I've seen a lot of maturity in the last couple of years from, I think, from everyone, you know, I think the, the, the ones, the, you know, the ones have, I'm not going to say the wines are better. I think that we are getting better all the time. And it's important that the wines get better every year. But there's, there's been a massive maturity in the way that um, I think that the smart plant has approached um, marketing itself, uh, the way individuals have gone about farming, uh, making wine. And, you know, that's something that resounds with me. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm not here to be funny. You know, I don't think anyone is there to be funny, but I, I can see how that comes across that way sometimes. But I think generally... You know, we've, had, we've started to address serious issues like, like you know, 
what's going to be the varieties that we need to plant that's going to withstand the heat and the drought. Um, you know, just, just securing good varieties, good vineyards, um, and 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 the farming with the future in mind. I think if we could if we could stick to that, we'll be we'll be successful. And if if, if we could get all the, I think there's there's a there's a there's a big um, uh, um, cohesive effort at the moment. You know, that's that's I think that's one of the reasons why it's been successful. But if we can keep at it, if we could all you know put in the same direction, it's gonna it's gonna be the success of the Swatland. Well, I think the the continued success of the Swadland because it's very much in place already. Thanks to people like yourself giving us a taste of a, a lovely white blend that a couple of people have uh, confirmed with their comments they absolutely love and uh, a quite delightful syrup just soft and juicy and glorious uh but those are just two of the city on a hill a range that is growing and as we heard from andre is going to continue to andre thank you very very much really appreciate the time really appreciate the wine as well uh, my journey with okay. city on a hill is very much in its infancy but i suspect it's going to be a uh, quite a long road ahead and i'm really excited about seeing where your wines go and being a very important part of the consumption process thanks a lot dan it's been uh, it's been a privilege to be on your show thanks a lot so we go andre brains the man who makes wine for nadia and her assistant david but also makes his own city on a hill range and what a range it is and it's something i love about so many of our winemakers the fact that they are more than willing to give of their knowledge to give time to the the rising stars those coming up through the winemaking ranks and just grow the pool of knowledge and by extension the variety and excitement of the wine that we have here in South Africa. Uh, David himself went through that journey. He's now giving Andre that same opportunity, and it just continues to make the whole wine industry a better place. And we, as those who drink and enjoy the wine, are all the richer for it. So that's another week. Big thank you to Andre Brains from City on a Hill and to Johan Simon from his little corner of the Swatland with his delightful range of Method Ancestral, the Dragon Ridge Supernova from the Fane Boss Estate, popular holiday spot, popular place to get wine from as well. So we're drifting towards the end of our Swartland journey. We've had five consecutive shows. We've got another one coming up on Thursday. There might be one more after that if we can haul in Mr. Bardenhorst. We'll see if we can get him online uh, and maybe even a Mullineau or two. Uh, but for now, coming up on Thursday, uh, you saw some very, uh, uh, very eye-catching art for City on a Hill. Well, this is very different. This is Colbrook, and we'll be having the Colbrook from Swatland. That's that label. Uh, very playful. We'll be trying that on Thursday. And then a range I have not tried before, the Ranosterbos. So we've actually, I think we've got three of their bottles. Uh, so there we go. That's the Myrtle Dean uh, from the Hoff Street Winery. It isn't in Hoff Street itself, um, but uh, we've got three wines to try from there. As our Swatland journey continues. Remember, if you have the opportunity jump on have a look at melulambert.com for some terrific wine writers from one of my very very favorite scribes keep safe keep healthy keep well and if you haven't done so already join that pick and pay wine club i really hope that johan simon is wrong and it's not an entire month to go and that we see wine sales back a little sooner and once they are up and running if you remember the pick and pay wine club which is free to join you get three times the smart shopper points as well as a 20 percent discount on 10 specially selected wines each and every month and on top of that just a really good selection at your local pick and pay so a great opportunity to support South African wine and South African winemakers. And after two lockdowns, it is an industry that is pretty much on life support. So get out there when you can and support South African wine. Thanks for joining us. Uh, belated happy Women's Day for yesterday. I hope you've had a good long weekend here in South Africa, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you back on Thursday. Goodbye.